Uh, Dr. Piva, or Joe Piva brings more than three decades of experience to GeoLearn and our Mentoring Mondays program. From the start, as a university instructor, Joe has been committed to education and bringing course material to professionals and technicians in various settings since 1975. His broad experience in the geospatial fields includes teaching surveying as an assistant professor at University of Missouri, Columbia, developing and instructing online courses as adjunct facility faculty at Missouri University of Science and Technology, designing professional and technician continuing education, engineering and geomatics practice, product development and business management. Past posts include Vice President of Sokia Technology and Trimble, a CEO at Gateway, Gatewing, and an independent consulting for a large selection of companies engaged in geomatic product development and sales. So without further ado, we appreciate you uh, jumping on and anybody can kind of chime in again. This is our kind of open week session for anybody uh, taking the exam. So Dr. Pive has got a few uh, tips and tricks to get us started and we'll kind of roll in from there with Q&A. So I appreciate it, Dr. Pive. Uh, but if you have questions, feel, feel free to just uh, jump in and ask them. Uh, so let's start by talking about the calculator. Well, what do you get? Well, only get one if you don't have a calculator or if you do have one, uh, check on the ncws.org site to see if it is an approved calculator. If it is not, get rid of it. I'm not saying throw it in the trash, but start using one that's approved because um, the one thing that all the proctors know is how to read a list and see if your calculator meets the specified calculator. And if it isn't, you just won't be allowed to take it in. Now, the good thing is that there is a TI calculator, I can't remember the model off the top of my head, that's also available for the FS and PS exams on screen. But most of you are not used to using a mouse to click on buttons on a calculator. And so that will slow you down. So it's a nice backup to have, but don't um, try to rely on it as your primary calculator, even if you take the real version of the calculator plan or if you do have the real version of calculator. Uh, so the list is updated every year. And so if you bought your calculator a few years ago and you're thinking you want to take it into your exam later this year, you want to go in, go in at least check. The list is updated every November. Right? It used to be every October and I guess everybody slows down and right now it's updated in, in November. So, um, it's a, good, it's a good time to check for the next year if you have the correct calculator. And as I said here in my slide, uh, use it for all your studying. You know, if you can use it for all your work where it's permitted to use it for work. And because switching to it just a few days or weeks before the exam is horrible. I mean, I actually have situations where people have told me that they stopped at Walmart and bought a calculator on the way to the exam and oh my god you know that's like a surefire surefire way to uh, have all kinds of problems and maybe even fail the exam because using a calculator has to become some nature it's a really important part of this so learn how to use it and for the most part it at least means reading the manual maybe not cover to cover but there are going to be functions that you're not sure about and you want to make sure you get them right i'll tell you about some of them Obviously, you want to be super fluent with trig functions, logs, raising numbers to different powers, including fractional powers, taking reciprocals of numbers, and do you even know what that means? Uh, taking roots, square roots, cube roots, and so forth, and of course, the inverse of all these functions I just mentioned. But a really big one for surveyors, that's a huge time saver if you learn to do this early, is to do polar to rectangular conversions. And what is polar to rectangular? Well, if you have studied algebra formally as a course, you know that the coordinate of a point, uh, let's just talk about the two-dimensional two plane for now, can be given in rectangular form, meaning X and Y, you know, north uh, or, or X 200 or east 200 and so forth. But that same point can be identified by drawing a straight line distance from the origin to that point, And that would be considered the uh, R or radius of the circle, essentially. 
and then a, a central angle. And so you need to be able to do that because when you calculate traverses, which is inevitable, you'll have that on your exams, including CST at some point anyway, is that you will have to ca calculate what we call latitudes and departures, which means you also need to know what latitudes and departures mean because any textbook that you pick up and look at doesn't matter. So I have this old textbook from when I used to teach surveying at the University of Missouri. Um, I should change my... Uh, um, well, I'll do that later. Yeah, but it's, it's, but it's the, blurred back, the blurred background is what's kind of blurring it out. <laughs> yep. I need to, uh, let me go to video and see if I can change that quickly. There you go. No, that's perfect. So this is a really old book. This is Mafia and Bouchard, seventh edition. And I just thought I'd mention to some of you old guys, Moffitt was a photogrammetrist at Berkeley. Bouchard, I don't even know his background. I'm sure it can, it can find, but I think he passed away in the 40s. So he wrote the original textbook. Um, so Moffitt was Wolf's instructor. Some of you guys have talked about Wolf, and Wolf was Gilani's instructor. And some of you have talked about Gilani. So this heritage of photogrammetry driving a lot of the least squares publications that are readable and understandable to surveyors today kind of go back that far. And I don't know if Bouchard was involved or not. But anyway, I, I digress. My point is latitudes and departures are what all textbooks, whether it's a real old one or brand new one, will tell you is the north, south, and east, west components of a line in a traverse. Now, you might be used to thinking of it as latitude, that the latitude is a delta northing, the difference between the northings at the endpoints, and a departure is the Delta Eastings, that's fine, but you better have that mnemonic device to help you remember. And I tell people the easiest way to remember is departure has E as its second letter, it goes east, west, uh, and then latitude is the other direction. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I have all kinds of silly uh, mnemonic devices. And by the way, mnemonic is a word that won't come up on the exam, but uh, something you might want to think about because I always ask my students, what letter of the alphabet does mnemonic begin with? And the answer is M as in M for Mary, um, but that's for another day. So you need to be able to convert back and forth because the cool thing is it also goes backwards. It does the inverse. So if you know the Delta Northings, the Delta Eastings or the latitude and departure, it will give you the azimuth and the um, length of the line. Now, some of you may have a surveying program you've loaded in my big fear when I load in programs and take them into the exam is what's going to happen between the time I leave home and I get to the exam. Is it possible to accidentally erase the program that you're depending on? Uh, so, so keep that in mind. It's a really important part for traverse computations. It hugely speeds things up because you don't have to look up sines and cosines of anything because the rectangular the polar uh, function does it for you. And I've listed here on my slide, it's sometimes called the P to R function uh, on a lot of HPs especially, but it's also sometimes called the X, Y to R comma theta, R being the radius, theta being the angle. Something else that you should be able to do easily if you have this function in your calculator is from decimal degrees to either HMS or DMS, basically degrees comes before the decimal point minutes occupies the second two decimal places, the first and second decimal places, and then seconds occupies the third and fourth decimal places. And, and then if you have decimal seconds, like point something of a second, it can actually be the fifth decimal place. You can have hundreds and so forth, but learn to use those easily because using, you know, dividing by 60, multiplying by 60 is a pain. You should still know it as a backup, but, uh, but you should uh, be able to use this. Now on some calculators, there's even a system like you, you old fogies with HP 41s, you know that we have a function to add and subtract HMS angles, which is really cool. 
most of the newer calculators don't have it, but I think there are a few calculators maybe not approved by NCAAs like some of the sharps that will actually allow you to add and subtract angles that way. So, so be aware of exactly how your calculator works. In general, when you have to take a trig function, you have to convert the angle from degrees, minutes, and seconds to decimal degrees before you take that trig function. And for some reason, decided doesn't want to cooperate. Okay, there we go. Yeah. So whether you choose to convert HMS to decimal by hand or with a function, and if it's by hand, hopefully you all know you divide seconds by 60, it gives you minutes, including decimal minutes, then you divide that by 60 and it gives you uh, the minutes and seconds as a, as a decimal part of an angle, and then you add it to the full degrees. But one of the things that people don't know is how many places to carry decimal degrees. Uh, and I see this with my students all the time, especially if you haven't done this much, they might write down two or three decimal places. Well, two or three places may be fine, but there are times when two or three decimal places will not be fine. So a simple rule I tell people is, think about it this way, a minute is one sixtieth of a degree. So running out to just one decimal place is not gonna be enough, but 0.01 degree, which would be a hundredth of a degree, that's uh, more resolution than one sixtieth would be fine. And so I've listed on this, uh, slide deck and Trent will have the, the slide deck available for you. So uh, don't worry about taking notes hurriedly, but I gave the example of what one second is and even a 10th of a second. So you kind of can figure out in your head, okay, I need to carry, because in an exam, you want to go as fast as you possibly can. And if you have to write down intermediate results, writing out, down all those extra decimal places all the way up to 16 or whatever you call calculated displays, is not necessary if you go this far out that I have listed here. So then there are calculations uh, that will come up. For example, what is T if R equals 1476.0 and delta is 33.1417? Now this might be a particularly difficult problem on an FS exam because this would take a little bit longer than if all the numbers were nice and round. So here you have to convert degrees minute uh, 33, 14, 17 to degrees, minutes, and seconds. Um, and so it, it can take a little bit of time, but then who knows what the, uh, what the equation is? Does anybody know what it is off the top of their head? Nobody, really? <laughs> We've all become brain dead with our computers. So, so. Never mind. Go ahead. No, Go ahead never mind. It's, 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 the, it's, the, it's the tangent function. That's what you need to get. Yeah. It's just looking at what it is. The tangent equals the tangent of half delta times the radius or something like I don't, I don't have it in front yeah. of me, but it's, it's that area. So, so I'm, so I'm uh, should I stop sharing? Yeah, let me stop sharing and go to the, uh, um, go to the, what's called the reference handbook that uh, NCAAS gives you in the exam. And by the way, once you've logged in to NCAAS, you can actually um, get access to this and download it to your computer. Because one of the things you need to do, can everybody see it now? It says yeah. fundamentals of surveying. Yep. Okay. So uh, by the way, either this or the syllabus was updated as of the end of July. So if you have done this before, you need to go in and download the new version. Um, they actually have had a warning that I did it in preparation for this session, because I had the old version on my computer and I haven't compared to see what's different. But this is the reference handbook. Okay, this thing runs 100 and some pages, 187 pages, okay? But this is the reference, so you think it's a closed book exam, but they actually give you a lot of cheats, cheat sheet stuff. And that's what I call it, the cheat sheet, if you've studied properly. And so it starts with, by the way, of course, as a preface, you don't want to read that during the exam, but you might find this useful. 
is abbreviation and acronyms. It's a table of contents. So if you're trying to look something up, you can zoom there really fast. Now, it doesn't take you there, but you can scroll then quickly. So what was the question I was just asking about? Oh, yeah. So horizontal circular curves. Hopefully you all understood it's horizontal circular curves. It's on page nine. I just clicked on it. Hopefully it'll be, uh, what's the word? Uh, when you can click and it jumps, um, there's a word that's escaping me right now. The hyperlinks. I'm still flustered yeah. from my technical. <laughs> hyperlinks. Hyperlinks. Yep. So on the horizontal circular curves, if you go down this list, uh, you'll see that uh, uh, Jim Cohn told you that T equals R tangent of I over two. Here's the problem. In my problem statement, I said delta is such and such. You don't see any deltas on this page. So even if you know your stuff, one of the things you really need to do is sit down and go through every single page of your reference document that NCWS will give you. The only thing that you're allowed to use as a reference, because it could be that you're used to thinking about the central angle of a curve as a delta. And if you look at this figure carefully, you will see it's the same as I. And people, you know, the old fogies know that in the old days, all, the central angle was always called I, probably I for interior or something like that. And partly because in the old days, it was a pain in the neck, actually some other part of the anatomy to put in Greek letters. So it was a lot easier to use English letters. So Keep this in mind. This is especially true with horizontal and vertical curves, but you'll see this in other places as well. You really need to know exactly what each of those variables in those equations means, especially if you're used to the equations in the textbook you're studying from where the variables may be called something else. And you can write it down in your printed out version to help you remember, but keep in mind when you're in the exam, all you have is what NCWS gives you, which is which is this nice pristine copy like I have here with no markings that you put on. So if you have no idea what I is, even if it'll take, even if you can figure it out by looking at this diagram, it's gonna cost you precious seconds. And I really think seconds is important because if nothing else, a few seconds gives you the time to go, <gasps> take a breath because taking a breath during the exam is really important. Okay, so I'm not gonna work this problem. I was gonna work it when I was gonna have in the studio and I was gonna have a calculator on the screen, but you know, it's gonna be boring to have me calculate this stuff. Mm -hmm. What I might do is uh, calculate the answers and put them into the PowerPoint before I ship them over to Trent so that you can check your work if you wanna do anything like that. So let me go back to the, let me stop sharing screen and go back to the other document. And I don't know if there's an easier way to do this, but that's the way I know to do it. Okay, so then you can plug into it. So you calculate 33, 14, 17 into decimal take half of that, take the tangent of that, multiply it by the radius. That's what that equation was. By the way, when you do this, one of the things I tell my students all the time is know what the answer is. And they all go, well, how could we know what the answer is? You know, that's why we have calculators. And I say, yes, that's true, but you should at least know what the ballpark is. And here's where the troublesome part is. When you take 33, 14, 17, if you get 33.683, would you think that would be correct? Yeah, the old guys are shaking their heads because you can see that it's 1417, right? So 15 minutes would be exactly a quarter of a degree. So you know when you convert this to decimal that you better get an angle that's a little bit less than 33.24. And if you don't, then you know you made a keying mistake maybe. Uh, maybe you called the wrong function and maybe instead of converting from degrees, minutes and seconds to decimal degrees, you went the other way and you accidentally converted it to degrees, minutes and seconds, which is nonsensical in this particular case. But those kinds of things happen in an exam. All right, 
If you have any questions, just sing out. All right. Now, with that same with that same equation, they might instead ask a different problem, and you have to figure out how to do algebraic manipulation. If the t is 1073.76 and delta is, and it, what is the delta if the r is 1200 feet? So you need to figure out how to rework the terms in the equation to get there. So I'll put that equation in, in here. Uh, because we're taking delta over two, it's a, it, it's a significant question to ask because in the stress of an exam, sometimes people will calculate delta but really what they've calculated is delta over two. So you need to check your work and read the problem really carefully. And I'm gonna to bet to you that the logical distractors, that's what they call the wrong answers, that one of the logical distractors will be delta over two for this particular problem. I'll put it this way. That's what I would do if I was creating this exam question for NCAAS because I know how people make mistakes. All right, so for the previous problem, what is the length of the curve from the PC to the PT, right? So if you're given this information, we're talking about radius and tangent and all this stuff, and all of a sudden, they're asking you a completely different problem, right? So can you take the same data and calculate the length of the curve from the PC to the PT? So, um, so those kinds of things are really important for you to be able to do, to look at an equation or set of equations and say, aha, if I know this and I calculated this, then I can be plugged back into a different equation and come up with the answer. All right, so this previous math discussion is not significant digits. That's a whole other topic which I'm gonna get into right now. So here's some rules on significant figures because I can guarantee you, they'll ask you a few questions. They probably won't ask you as many questions as we will take discussing it right now, but it's something to have in your back pocket because this is not covered in your reference handbook. The first thing to remember is that the number of decimal places in a number is not the number of significant digits. Zeros, by the way, some people spell zeros without the E that I have in there. And some people put, um, and I like to put the E in. So uh, don't let that phase you too much, but zeros are significant if they're between other significant figures. So 38.09, that zero there is obviously significant. 5,002, you know, it's not 5,000. So it is significant or less than unity. Okay, so in, in a textbook, they'll say for less than unity. What the heck is that? They mean for less than one. Okay, any number less than one. For less than unity, zeros to the right of a decimal, whoops, I have a typo there, are not significant. So in point zero 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 five eight nine, there's only three significant figures. And you'll have these rules, um, but most surveying textbooks will have these as well. Zeros at the end of decimal numbers are significant. So if I have 66.200, that's different from 66.20 and 66.2. And you need to be aware of that. Can I make a statement here, yes. Jim, if you don't mind? That is one of the most important things for a surveying technician to understand right there. That is huge. Exactly. And, and it doesn't it doesn't help that the old surveyors notes sometimes if they didn't have decimals there, they didn't throw them into their field book, even though they actually measured to the nearest tenth or a hundredth or something like yeah. that. Especially yeah. common with chains and links. You know, you know that they surveyed usually to a link. So a link is a hundredth of a chain if you're using a 66 foot chain with a hundred links. And no, being aware of that is important and especially when you do conversions. Now and then you'll see a quarter link or a half link. Yeah. yeah. All right, yeah, so you know, thank I, you, Jim. I've, I've seen it today that, you know, your, your, your technicians will come in and good surveyors, well, people really want to do a good job, 
They run a little loop and they'll bring back uh, the information. They'll book it to the nearest ten thousandth of a foot, or something like that, because that's what the electronic level ga gave them. You know, and yep. that's crazy. Unless you're working for an agency like NGS, you know, uh, you're dreaming if you think your work is that. Uh, oh, of course, yes. Significant. I All always right. love getting the uh, slope stake printouts for a design project. And having them out to four four places uh, for slope stake work. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay, so so a few more rules on significant figures. Uh, um, when whole when a whole number ends in zeros, you need to manually indicate the significant figures. So 60, 65 thousand. Whoops, that's a mistake there. I put the comma in the wrong place. But 65,000, 654,000, my mistake, uh, could have three, four, five, or six significant figures. So usually what you do is you put a bar over the last uh, zero, the last number that is significant. So if it has only three, you would put a bar, meaning a line like a, call it a bar, just a straight line drawn over the four. But if it really is 654,000, it's intended to be six significant figures, then you would put the bar over the last zero. But here's another way to do it. And this may be a trick that NCWS might use to see if you know an alternate way of expressing numbers, which is uh, scientific notation of one kind or another. 65.4 times 10 to the fourth has three significant figures. 65.40 has four significant figures. And these are the same number, meaning 654000 zero, 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 in terms of running it out. Hopefully you all know this times four stuff. If you don't, you, know, you could be lost at some point in the exam. I'm not gonna say it makes a difference. It will make a difference between uh, passing and failing, but it could be a problem. Okay, so in multiplying numbers, the product should not have more significant figures than those in the factor with the lowest number of significant figures. And I have an example to go through that. For sums, the last significant figure in the column should correspond to the last full column of significant figures, and I'll illustrate that too. And when I say sums, I also mean a subtraction. And on this one, when I say in multiplying, I also, on rule number six, I also mean division. When measurements are in one set of units, they can be converted with the same number of significant figures as the original originating number. Now, keep in mind that constants are exact and are always carried to the full number of significant places or decimal places, and they don't count. You know, any conversion constant doesn't apply. You just use it as it's given to you. And if you're really wise, uh, you might be able to figure out that, you know, the 10th decimal place on something doesn't need to be used here, just like we often make that decision with pi or something like that. But in this particular case, I have one, two, three, four, five in the square significant figures in the square foot number. And then I have one, two, three, four, five significant numbers of figures in acres. And you should try to try to follow that although sometimes it gets a little ridiculous because I'm not really sure that um, when we get 47,356 square feet, that we really know it to the nearest half square foot. And in a lot of properties, you probably don't. You start to look at your individual measurements, but that's a different story altogether. It has to do more with errors and analysis. So here's an example of a product. So 5.23 times 6.9425 and so forth. And I just showed you some of the intermediate results which you should go ahead and carry out. But if you look at this, we have four significant digits in the 6152, one, two, three, four, five in the 81002, just three here. So that's the lowest number, right? So after I calculate all this, it, you, re, you report an answer of 0.729. So here, 
uh, we have sums. So this can be subtraction as well, or a combination of positive and negative numbers. So basically you line them up and you add them up. But then you go in and say, where do we have the lowest number? And we have the lowest number right here, last full, excuse me, I said that wrong. Where's the last full column? The last full column is the tenths line. So this would get rounded to 450.1, which is a little surprising to some people. Now this would be different if 316.8 was actually 316.80, then you would carry it out one more decimal place. So be a little careful about this. I uh, like Jim's comment, the surveyors ignored it and the geology people did, didn't or something like that. Or maybe she wasn't in surveying school. So what about conversion factors? So here's some conversion factors. Um, what do you do with these? Well, you carry them out as far as you need to, to make sure that the final result doesn't change. And the good example there is the 3.14159265359. And by the way, I haven't uh, memorized it that far out, but that's pi. And now your calculator will probably carry it out that far, if not further. But everybody knows what 66, I'm assuming. Everybody knows what 43560 is. What's 25.4? That one, I don't know. Uh, Rob, you're muted. Uh, Number of meters per inch. It's, it's, it's actually, it's millimeters in an oh, inch. Per inch, yeah. Right? I do this all the time when I've, when I've got a socket wrench and all I have are maybe finer sizes in millimeters and try to get something to fit. I often just use 25, you know, do the mental math to figure out in millimeters what it's going to be. What is nine over five, you think, as a conversion? Celsius to Fahrenheit? Yeah, yeah, there you go. So uh, actually, <laughs> Celsius, right? No, it's, it's, you're right, Celsius to Fahrenheit. Uh, what's 1200 over 3937? Yeah, uh, survey feet and meters. Yep, yeah. and what's the 3048? International feet yeah. and meters. Yeah, exactly. And we all know 32 is the freezing point. What's, I just threw this in for grids, point zero 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 six five. Yeah, Jim knows that. Point. Yeah, I, I, yeah, because I'm old. <laughs> That's, That's the coefficient of thermal expansion of steel. <laughs> <laughs> You know, this one came in really handy one time I was testifying in court. And for some reason, the lawyer decided to ask me that question, even though it had nothing to do. He was probably flipping through books, trying to figure out how he could stump this chump. And he came across this number. So he said, do you know what this number is? And I said, it's the coefficient of expansion of steel uh, when you're using uh, units of Fahrenheit. Uh, temperature. And he said, oh, my book doesn't say that. <laughs> it, didn't, it, didn't say, it didn't say the Fahrenheit. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. What's the 57.2957795 uh, one? Um, now I'm not, uh, again, I'm old. We used to use that. Yeah, so you use it in, in uh, horizontal curves. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Sean, you got it right. It's 57.2957795 degrees per radian. That's right. And I remember a long time ago, because I haven't written questions for the NCWS exam in a long time, but I wrote a question, what's a radian? Because a radian is basically the central angle on a circle where the angle subtended is an arc that's the length of the radius of that circle. And it's a hard one to figure, but here's what it is. There are two pi radians in a circle on the circumference. You know, that's where this whole thing, it, it kind of falls out. What's the six, what, you all know what the 5280 is. What's 6076.11549? Nautical mile? 
Yep, nautical mile. And the rule of thumb that I used, which is not, you know, it, it, it's exact to two decimal places, is uh, that a nautical mile is 15% longer than a statute mile. So I did some, <laughs> so I did some words, uh, just some, we're gonna go through, through some vocabulary and you may need to know what a vernier is. Uh, now you may not, to, may not, you may not have to necessarily read this, but you need to know that a vernier is a device used to subdivide the main part of a scale so that you can read it finer because that was the standard technique, uh, even with, uh, with um, surveying compasses. Surveying compasses, you often set off the declination to the nearest minute or five minutes using a vernier. And just for grins, uh, because most transits that I used anyway had an A and a B vernier, and you're seeing here, look at the A vernier, the B vernier was located 180 degrees from here. And there's a whole other story when I get to present someday on uh, how instruments work. But, but here's 180 degrees, here's 190. So this is one, two, three, four, five. So it's somewhere between 184 and 185. Now you notice there's a mark in between the 184 and 185. So the main circle is graduated in half degree increments. The vernier scale goes out in, uh, goes out to 30. And so what it's telling me is that this is a vernier from a one minute transit because it allows me to, to actually measure and what you do is you look for alignment of the numbers on one scale and the other scale. And where they're exactly aligned is where you have, uh, where you have the number. And it's been a while, but I'm gonna guess that it's probably 20 minutes because these two look really well aligned. So it's uh, 184 degrees, 20 minutes. Um, but I have some other vocabulary words here. Oh, astrolabe. Astrolabe is a simple concept and uh, people use these, uh, I think the uh, Arab navigators may have started using this or maybe the Indians, but basically you can make one of these. You essentially hold up a protractor vertically with a plumb line hanging down to make sure that 180 is actually uh, aligned with the direction of gravity. And then you have a pointing system that you point at the star. And if you point this at the North star, that vertical angle that you've shown there is your latitude within a degree or so. Now, if you're in a moving boat, it's not gonna be that accurate, but this is how navigators got around the earth. They didn't know how to determine longitude, but they could determine latitude pretty roughly. And so when the early navigators started, they would like set off from Lisbon or Madrid or wherever the they were sailing from if they're going to the new world. And the first thing they would do is they would sail south or usually south to the latitude of some South American port and then try to sail as westward as they could to try and hit it because that was the only way they knew how to do it because they didn't know how to compensate for winds and currents and all that kind of stuff. And so they would periodically do these observations to get back on that latitude that they needed to be on to get to their destination. So, so this is going through part of the alphabet. I'm not going to go through the entire alphabet because we need to move on to other stuff, but here's bathymeter. So some of you know what bathymetry is. A bathymetric map is a map that shows the contours of an ocean bed, well, the bed of any body of water, basically. And how do you get those contours? Well, you measure the water level very carefully and you measure your draft that's shown here. And then you have a, usually a sonar device that projects a pulse and, uh, and a transducer that uh, emits the pulse and then a receiver that collects the pulse and the echo time, literally the echo time is what's used to calculate the distance realizing it traveled twice the distance. Of course, they have lots of calculations they apply for things like the density and salinity of the water to correct for the correction time of the pulse of sound in, in the water. And they also have to correct for heave, in, in other words, the swells in the water. And so very often a, a bathymetric mapper that's going full bore will also have what's called a heave sensor on board. 
So I threw this in only because GIS is becoming more and more of a term and this is really a mapping term. This is not GIS, but it could start showing up and choropleth simply means that it's a map that uses shading or coloring to denote various categories or classes of information shown on the map. But choropleth is a name, is a word that you might want. So here's dependent resurvey. So this is the time for me to point out another reference that you guys need to own. If you don't own this by the time you go to the exam, shame on you. I mean, especially you FS and PS people. You know, your CSTs would be excused. But if you don't own this, shame on you. Now, obviously you can't take this to the exam, but what you need to do is flip through the book and see, gosh, do I know, know these terms? Now, this is as boring as reading a telephone book if you even know what that it is. <laughs> um, but, but you really should. So I just thought I'd look up dependent resurvey. So when you, because I want to read what it says, and you actually, it directs you to resurvey dependent. That's the other thing. You need to know the alphabet really fast. So you're not doing ABCDFG all the time trying to uh, look up stuff when you're studying. Um, so resurvey dependent, conducted to accomplish restoration based on the original conditions recorded. The dependent resurvey is conducted by first identifying existing corners and other rec recognized and acceptable points of control of the original survey, blah, 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 blah. Uh, this type of resurvey is used where there is fair agreement between the conditions on the ground and the conditions of the original survey. Um, so I just thought I'd throw that out there because these are things that you need to have at least read. And right next to it is resurvey independent, which is basically not dependent on the records of the original survey, but is intended to supersede that. So it completely throws out the older survey within the boundaries of that area being resurveyed. Uh, extinguishment. So I thought I'd again, do a little bit of reading no, I have another book here. Let's see if it got moved here. Um, another book that I strongly suggest for legal terms is uh, get yourself a pocket a Black's Law Dictionary. In your office, you probably have an, an unabridged version, which is uh, as big as a gigantic doorstop. Uh, but the pocket uh, Black's Dictionary is about maybe three times as thick as this. It's definitely not gonna go in most pockets, but um, it has fewer terms and a lot there. Go ahead, Trent. I was gonna turn on, where are we at? I'm trying to show it up. Uh, uh, there we go. <laughs> 11th edition there. But. Yeah, I have my copy that I purchased when I was studying to take the land surveying exam some, I don't even know, great to say, 40 years ago. And I haven't bothered to replace it because it's not the kind of book that changes a whole lot. And I use my updated, my fairly new um, pocket edition if I need to look up something that's fairly new. For example, that old edition I have is not gonna have anything on the internet, for example, or social media, not that that's so important for surveying, but just to give you an example of something that would not be in the older book. But extinguishment has nothing to do with fighting fires, if that's where you're going with this. Does anybody want to volunteer uh, kind of a rough definition? Okay, since you're looking things up, I'm just gonna read it just so it's a good idea to know the terminology that's used. I think it was, uh, who was it? Uh, maybe it was Tony and he was talking about uh, expert witnessing, Nettleman. And he said, don't use the word gun, right? We are used to using certain vernacular. Uh, we use slang when we're talking among ourselves to describe surveying procedures, you know, we dump the total station pole or stick or whatever you want to call it, you know, your RTK total station. But we don't use those terms when we're speaking formally. You certainly don't use it when you're testifying in court. And you're not going to find those words on the NCWS exam. So you better know what the correct terminology is. 
for all those operations. And that's why for looking up and reading some of these definitions. So extinguishment is to render legally non-existent, to destroy or render void, to nullify, to avoid as by payments and so forth. The act of ex extinguishing is distinguished from the mere transfer, passing or suspension of a right or obligation. Okay, flattening. Flattening is a word. Uh, geodesy is uh, par for the course on the NCWS exams. They're not gonna expect you to know a whole lot of advanced stuff there, but you better know what flattening is. So I threw in a little, little example. Uh, and I don't think you expect, to, you might not even be expected to calculate it, but to know what it is. Uh, geoid, this is a really important term. Now this also is ge geodesy. However, every surveyor practically is expected to know this term, why? Because every surveyor is expected to know about the tools of his or her trade. And you can't do GNSS surveying, which is updated from GPS, without knowing about the geoid. And if you haven't bothered to learn about the geoid, not only are you putting yourself in jeopardy in your professional practice, you're probably putting yourself in jeopardy in, um, in the exam. So the geoid, uh, so the figure on the, on, on the left, you probably may not be able to read it because it's really low resolution and I blew it up a little bit too much, but it shows you that, uh, the Earth's surface and where the ellipsoid is, which is what the flattening is computed for, which is an idealized shape, an ellipsoid of revolution. And, uh, and uh, the geoid on the, on the other hand is where the strength of gravity is equal. And so you can have higher and lower, so your orthometric height, but we often used to use call mean sea level, which is no longer a term that should be used by surveyors except to explain things to lay people, the, the orthometric height is measured off of the geoid. And that's why you have a geoid model. Because when I ask people, what's the geoid? They say, oh yeah, that's the geoid model. But well, that's not an, that's not an explanation. The geoid model is simply, if you will, a gigantic lookup table that tells you for any particular place on the earth, what the height difference is between the ellipsoid and the geoid because GPS can only calculate the height above the ellipsoid. So you have to apply a correction called the geoid height or the geoid correction or the geoid separation, depending on whose textbook you're reading. So how is horizontal defined? You guys who are um, in the process of getting licensed or certified. In surveying, how do we define the horizontal? Okay, so um, it goes actually to a more fundamental concept called the vertical. We define the vertical in surveying as the direction of gravity. And so the di direction of the vertical are very good, Jen. Uh, yeah, so the horizontal is perpendicular to the direction of gravity, which means the horizontal where I am is not the same as the horizontal where you are, because we have two completely different vertical lines which are not parallel to each other. When we do plane surveying, we assume that all the vertical lines are parallel to each other. But even then, we know that if we do a fairly large survey, we'll do leveling, hopefully, with a differential level rather than a total station and figure out that we actually have some curvature of the earth that we're correcting for. IMU in, uh, stands for inertial measurement unit. Uh, so inertial measurement units are very common in you know, lots of devices. Um, all drones have them, but a lot of uh, um, mobile mapping systems, whatever they are, will have them. It's very common to have them on uh, mapping systems on the water because they have one more system to keep track of where they are. 
an inertial measurement unit essentially is keeping track of position. Problem with IMUs is that they drift, so you constantly need to reset. And so you have other technology, if it's GPS or something else, that helps you get there. So joint tenancy, I'm not going to read these to you, but you might want to look, look it up. There's three kinds of tenancy that are most commonly used in uh, real property law. You have tenancy in common, tenancy by the entireties, and joint tenancy. And in joint tenancy, people own as, a, as joint tenants. The remaining tenants take the entire property, meaning the person who died does not pass their rights to their heirs. Uh, not is a nautical mile per hour. So here we go, level line or surface. So level line or surface is basically a curved line and it's the geoidal line. It's a geoidal surface or something parallel to the geoid. And, and, and I'll just say, if you read a geodesy book, there's, there's many of them that are a little bit easier to read than others. Uh, this is my favorite, geodesy. History Concepts of Modern Geodesy by James Smith. Uh, interestingly, Roy Minnick was the series editor. It's uh, published by Wiley. Um, but uh, uh, th there's something called a geop, and a geop is basically uh, uh, something like a geoid, but at something other than zero elevation. So is this declination east or west if the red line is where, make, where the needle points to north? If magnetic north is in the direction of the red line and a geographic north or the North Pole is where is being pointed to by the blue line, is this declination east or west? This is something you would need to know because you may be given a problem that says, you know, a line has a magnetic bearing of such and such, and the magnetic declination is so and so east or west. And what is the true bearing of the line? That could be as simple as that. And if you don't know what this is, then you could be in trouble. So in this particular case, this is an east declination because the needle points to the east of. And if you read or talk to people enough, you you know that there's no such thing as true north, but in magnetic declination problems, we sometimes just go shortcut and say, yeah, true north. But true, there's no real, there's really no such thing as true north. There's, I don't know how many, but there may be over a dozen definitions of what north is. Mm -hmm. So here's something on professional practice and ethics. So you get a job, you have a discussion with a client, you know, they find you, I need you to do this work. So you find out what they want done. Hopefully you do that. Um, and you find out what they're not looking for to make sure you don't over deliver because it usually costs something to them and to you. And then survey describes what they do, what they will do, what they, when they will do it, estimate the cost and how they will charge. And then they also hopefully are talking about what happens when the survey is complete. In other words, do they get to review your survey before they pay you? You know, or do you have uh, some kind of payment arrangements and all that kind of stuff? So what do you think all of this stuff is best done? Is it best done orally? No, under professional practice guidelines, they would say best not to even though Technically, you can have an oral contract. Best to put it in writing. And what would you call that document that it's put into in writing? Contract, right? And the thing is that when I speak at conferences, you know, 200 people in the room, how many of you people sign a contract with your client before you start the work? And depending on the state, I'll see as few as 20% of the surveyors who put something down in writing. Now, sometimes the survey will say, well, we don't have a contract, we have an agreement. Well, as far as the law is concerned, it's the same thing. Uh, Overrun. So a survey takes much longer to get the job done. Well, the survey's effort takes way more investment of human and other resources than estimated. So what does the survey do? Just keep track of all of this? keep plugging away and then finally get it done and call up the client and say, hey, I finally got it done. 
And by the way, it's three times what I estimated. Would that be the appropriate way to conduct business? Uh, hopefully you're going to say no. Uh, first of all, if it's going to take longer, as soon as the surveyor knows it's going to go past the schedule that was quoted or promised, the surveyor should be contacting the client. Uh, what you don't want to become is the black hole of silence. But the other thing is, as you're doing the project, if you're discovering there's going to be overruns, cost increases without any changed conditions from the client's point of view, it's just that the job is taking longer than you thought, it's your obligation to inform the client because they need to have the option to say, I don't want you to go any further. And you need to have a contract that says you get paid for whatever work that's done, even if the job isn't finished. So surveyor engagement, who decides what rules, regulations, or standards that the survey will be in compliance with? In other words, you do a survey in your state, you may have standards of one kind or another. There may be some national standards that apply. Um, if they're doing an ALTA survey, there's standards that apply to them. So who decides what rules, regulations, or standards apply? Well, first of all, the client can specify them. But if the client hasn't specified them and you're doing, I'm going to call it a garden variety survey, you still need to be in compliance with what you are obligated to do by, uh, by law, by statute, by regulation, or it may simply be a, a recommended process that your uh, state association of surveyors recommends and you put it into your agreement or you mentioned it. And in this cheat sheet I talked about, there's a whole set of information on ethics, and you will find that the, uh, the canons of ethics are listed, and this happens to be something that relates to canon two. One of the best references, by the way, for uh, ethics in general is Dennis Moulin. He's uh, published the second uh, edition of his Ethics in Land Surveying book, available on Amazon, I think it's 20 or 30 bucks. And uh, where do you find out how to create a contract? Is there a guide somewhere? Yeah, there's lots of light guides and people will charge you a lot, but um, there are also some surveyors who do business kinds of presentations and Trent might, to, might want to invite one of them. But Trent, if you don't know who they are, I'll, send you a list of people that I know on the, who are on the lecture circuit. Please. Uh, here's a good one, stating opinion on projects publicly. So let's say there's a project going on that the city or the county or the state is doing and you decide to talk to a reporter about, those guys, they have no ideas what they're doing. You know, they surveyed this thing all wrong, you know, the the sewage is going to flow backwards and this, that, and the other. Um, basically, you have to be very careful about how you criticize uh, other people and other projects as a surveyor. You're supposed to be, this doesn't mean you can't be honest, but generally you go to the people who are screwing up and tell them rather than find the nearest reporter and blurt it out. So a survey agrees to a laser scan job. He's never done this before. The plan is to rent it, scan it, and then submit it after the bill is paid. This would be a big no-no because the survey is, is committing to a job that he has no expertise in. He needs to first become expert at this because surveyors assume to be expert at their measurement duties that they hold themselves out to. Uh, same thing with drone jobs and so on and so forth, or geodesy or control surveying and so forth. Surveying as an expert witness, a surveyor builds his testimony based on where his client wants the line or the corner or the walnut tree to be. This is very common uh, when I talk to surveyors and they will actually tell me openly, yeah, this is what I did. And Canon Force says basically that a survey is impartial. It doesn't matter who hired him. You should put the line wherever you determine it to be in all honesty, considering all the facts and considering all the facts without 
uh, prejudging and saying, you know, if I didn't measure this, this, and this, I can make this, I can scoop this line over a little bit. You know, that would be unethical. It would probably be illegal too, but it's unethical. Uh, yeah, this is Canon 4. Uh, boasting. So at a professional meeting, a surveyor talks about the million dollar contract they got to survey so many sites for company Y, but they've been told not to disclose that they're doing this job because they don't want the competitors to know that they're building all these new stores or whatever. Cannons are found on the NSPS site, uh, Cannons of Surveyors Ethics, but you'll find them listed in the uh, FS and PS handbooks that NCWS gives you. But Cannons are something that you're supposed to know about. By the way, just a short plug for GeoLearn, uh, Dennis Mullen did, uh, I think, four video courses on the topic of surveyors ethics and forests. And you could at least go to our YouTube channel and look at the previews that he has recorded. So Canon 5 basically says, if you haven't been authorized to talk about a particular job, then you should, it doesn't matter that you're surveying conference and nobody will find out. So uh, my headline is billboards, but basically Canon 6 talks about advertising in a professional way. So a survey ad advertises in a local magazine. Let's say your newspaper puts out a magazine and you're doing a real estate thing and you put out a uh, ad saying, you know, Jones and Jones surveys, we do these kinds of surveys. Here's a phone number, a website, and an email address. That would be perfectly fine. This, it's no longer that you can only do Yellow Pages advertising if you even know what Yellow Pages are. Um, Surveyor so advertises on several billboards around the city. That may be okay too, unless the surveyor says best surveys in town or cheapest surveys in town. You know, or you bring us the problems and we'll clean them up for practically nothing, you know, that would be inappropriate. Lawyers and title companies. So surveyor bad mouths their client's lawyer or the surveyor complains that the client's title company is no good or incompetent. This would be bad mouthing other professionals. Again, you take it to those professionals if you think that they are uh, performing a bad service, especially if it's for your client. Uh, it's not for you to do this bad mountain. Uh, changing horses is what I call this slide. This is a very common uh, question, not just on uh, NCWS exams, but I know of many state specific exams that will ask some version of this. States, state boards love to ask ethical questions. I shouldn't say that as a Matter of fact, for every single state in the union, but a lot of state boards like to ask professional practice and ethical questions. But in this case, Sylvia Jones is approached by Brown. So Brown is the landowner asking them to finish a survey, whoops, that should be survey started by Sylvia Smith. How does Jones respond in an ethical manner? Well, here's how you start. First of all, you say, as Sylvia, uh, has Sylvia Smith been discharged by you, by you, Mr. Brown? And there's a formal way you can do it with the letter. You know, where's the copy of the letter or the email that you sent him? Um, by the way, in the case of lawyers, and when I switch lawyers, lawyers have always asked me for a copy of the letter of discharge of the previous lawyer. And if the client hasn't done that, you might suggest that they write one. You could even help them draft it, but then they have to send it, they have to sign it, and you wait for a response because the response might be that Sylvia Smith says, well, okay, that's fine if you're firing me, but you need to pay me for the work I've done. And if that work isn't settled, then there's some ethical issues with you picking up, picking up the survey, even if Sylvia Smith is a total bozo, has taken six times as long as he promised to take, um, has been maybe doing stuff wrong, who knows? And it's still not for you to judge. Uh, 
it's a good idea actually for Surveyor Jones to actually call up Surveyor Smith after he gets a copy of the letter so you guys are clean, right? There's nothing outstanding before you pick stuff up. Now, it may be he has not been discharged and you could say, well, you need to discharge him. And he says, well, I don't want to. Can you still help? Because I think he's in trouble. I mean, genuinely in trouble. Well, what you could do, and you couldn't charge for that first call, is call up Sylvia Smith and say, hey, can I help you with this job? Mr. Mr. Brown called me and said that you might need some help and I'm willing to you know, do some consulting. And at some point you may have to start charging. I've done that myself. I've charged other surveyors for helping them out of a sticky technical situation, um, but there's an ethical way to do this. Uh, local boards, surveyor green lobbies and campaigns to get on the local planning and zoning board so that they can get an inside track on leads for jobs that are in trouble because the surveyors are not performing. Again, kind of like an ambulance chasing surveyor uh-uh, these people are, you know, losing money on the job because the survey is not performing, you know, let me go in and see if I can sneak in there because I know that would be totally unethical and it's covered in the canons. And that would be a good example of a, uh, uh, of another type of question that could be asked on the exam. So let me do a time check. It's 7.30, Trent. Should I go on or should I stop? Yeah, no, I, I mean, as long as everybody's uh, still good, I might... How many more uh, okay. you got? You got another 15, 20 minutes or what? Uh, so I have about 20 slides, but some okay. of them will go fast. Okay. This next yeah. couple will be slow. No, we're good. So I want to do economics. When I did economics, I realized, uh oh, I should have probably planned, probably told Trent that we would need two full sessions to try and do justice. And that's not full justice because this is obviously a semester kind of situation. Um, let me see if I can find. I don't see the. Oh, here it is. So there's many books that are similar to this engineering economic analysis. You won't find one called surveying and economic analysis. And the cool thing about these books, other than the books written by economists for economy it, it, classes in economics at, at college, is that they're written assuming it's somebody with kind of an engineering mentality. And I know some of you guys don't like to be called engineers, but we're closer to engineers than we are to some economics whiz kid out there in college. So they kind of put stuff down simply. But one of the things that you need to do is definitely study this. What I found is that I had studied engineering economics in college and I've paid particular attention to it. Don't ask me why. Oh, I know why. Because by the time I took my PE exam, I'd actually been doing economic analysis um, for my boss because one of the things he did, we, were small, we did small municipal engineering projects. So very often these things had to be bonded when I, when I say bonded, I mean issuing bonds to actually pay for the project. So we had a lot of financial involvement because usually these small, you know, 400 person villages didn't have the, the wherewithal to hire big name CPAs to come in and do this stuff for them. And so I actually, on my PE exam, I worked an engineering economics problem uh, and it helped me, you know, over the finish line. So this is not something that I'm going to recommend that all of you do it, especially if you're within a few weeks of taking the exam. But if you're a year out or two years out, it's worth getting your hands on a book and studying some of the easy parts. So I'm going to pay, uh, go through a little bit of the easy parts with a couple of problems. Look at the syllabus in, for the exam, or what they call the specifications as far as what they cover, as well as the handbook. And then pay attention to nomenclature. What's nomenclature? Nomenclature is what I talked about earlier, like I for delta, right? It's the names we give to different parts of an equation or a set of instructions on how to do a problem. So in this case, I've listed some, you know, A's uniform amount of dollars per period. So this would be like a, you know, a payment after you bought a piece of machinery or surveying equipment or something like that. 
as an example, future worth of current money at certain interest rate, I over here and so forth. P is present worth. Um, so here's a single payment compounding amount. So in the book, you actually have all these equations. So if you know how to figure these equations, you can solve these problems if you understand the rest of it, the, the book, and I noticed Trent put the link to uh, the particular book I had up here. Uh, no, it's not the book I had up here, but it's a book that he must recommend. But here, here's the problem. A note will mature in 25, at 25,000 in 30 months, meaning you've got to pay $25,000 in 30 months. The annual interest rate is 11%. What is the current value? In other words, how much money were you given if the deal was going to pay us back $25,000 at the end of 30 months? So because the interest rate is annual, one of the things you often have to do is convert it to interest rate per period. And that's one of the tricks. The other thing is interest rate of 11% as a raw number is 0.11. So you need to know that. So in this case, the interest rate per month is 0.11 divided by 12. And you carry this out uh, quite a few decimal places because you're doing these things to a certain, like in this case, power of 30. And you know what, that negative number is a mistake and it could take that out. So the equation is one plus I to the power 30. So you have one plus I, this is the interest rate per month because we're going for 30 months. But for some reason, this thing, whole thing was figured at years and let's say it was four years, then you could have used uh, this 0.11. Again, it wouldn't be 11, but 0.11, you're going to use the raw decimal value over here for i, and you'd only take it to the fourth power. But anyway, when you do this calculation, you get 0 0.76052. So you multiply that by the 25,000 you're going to pay at the end of this 30 months to get 19,013, which is what you get today. If you're not going to make any payments, but that'd be a balloon payment essentially at the end of the time period. So this is just one of the exam types of examples. Um, here's another one. This is a monthly payment of what is made for five years. In other words, every month you make a payment for 60 months. The interest rate is 10%. What is the payment per month if the total station costs $15,000? So this is called the Uniform Series Sinking Fund, and I won't get into explaining this, especially because time is short, but basically, the equation is I or one plus I to the nth power minus one here in the denominator. And so I is 10%, so you have 0 0.1 divided by 12, which works out to 0 0.00833 per month. You substitute in this equation and you get 0 0.01292. So you take that number, you multiply it by the principal amount, which is 15,000 to get $194, basically in round numbers per month. So those are just two examples. And if you know a little bit of this, and I noticed that Jen actually has this book. So some of you have actually encountered economic analysis, but you may be staying away from it because, you know, you go, oh my gosh, you know, the Boffins know this, but do I really want to mess with this? You know, that's why I hire accountants kind of thing. But they have a, a few questions. There's going to be a whole lot, but if you want to improve your chances and you just need to get comfortable with this, and they usually have good worked out problems. Uh, there's no good surveying book that, surveying economic analysis book that I'm aware of. Anyway. How do you calculate the circumference of a sphere? By the way, in the reference handbook, they give you the equation for calculating the volume of a sphere. It's right there in the geodesy uh, part, actually. How do you calculate the circumference of a sphere? Does anybody know? How do you calculate the circumference of a circle? Does anybody know? You can unmute yourself. Pi D, right? Pi times D or two pi R. So it's the same for a sphere. Because the circumference of a sphere is the circumference around any part of the sphere that's the largest uh, around it. So that brings up this question of a great circle. As a surveyor, you would be expected to know 
this possibly. I'm not saying it's going to be on the exam, it's guaranteed, but it's a term that you should know. So what is a great circle? So a great circle is that biggest circle that you can have inside a sphere. So the equator is a great circle. All the lines of latitude and long, uh, all the lines of longitude are great circles, but the lines of latitude, which cut across east-west, are not great circles. And by the way, if you didn't know this, when you fly in a plane, if you want to fly most efficiently, the straight, the, the shortest distance between two points on a sphere is along an arc. And so here we have. Uh, some place in North America, and maybe, uh, gosh, I don't even know what this is. Some place in Africa, perhaps? No, nope, that's Africa. Yes, yeah, some place in Asia. India. Actually. Yeah, looks like India, northern India. Maybe it's uh, Everest. Anyway, uh, you fly over the northern tip of Scandinavia, right there, Norway, Finland, and so forth. Southern tip of Greenland. Cut quite a swath across Canada, the maritime provinces probably, to get to New York. Uh, I have flown from, uh, from San Francisco to Beijing, which is over here, and gone within 100 miles of the North Pole, because that's actually, you think you're going uh, westward, but you actually go north to make it the shortest trip possible. Um, so, when it comes to calculating the circumference of a circle, uh, what is the circumference of the circle if the radius is a thousand feet? But if what, what if the thousand is actually 1000 point, point, point period, or 1000 point zero zero, or 1000 point zero zero zero, or if it's 990 and they're just rounding it to a thousand, or it's 998 and they're rounding it to a thousand. All of these can make a difference in what the final answer is. You know, we don't have time to go through all the possible combinations, but your final answer, in addition to the significant figures thing I talked about before, and actually can be done with significant figures, we need to look at this carefully. So 990 plus is probably two significant figures, whereas 998 might be three significant figures. So be careful of this if they're trying to test you on significant digits or in how you use surveying measurements to come up with, with solved uh, answers. So here's a question, what is a polygon? What are examples of polygons? Well, you probably know a pentagon is a polygon, a hexagon is a polygon, an octagon is a polygon. So polygon simply means many-sided, actually gone is angle, uh, in fact, Gone is the unit of measure in Europe. We have 400 gone to the circle. Uh, so that's what a polygon is. It's a closed figure with many sides. It could be as few as three. A triangle is a polygon, a square, a rectangle is a polygon and so forth. But then what is a regular polygon? That's one that's graduated from high school. <laughs> So regular polygon simply means that all the sides are equal and therefore all the angles are equal. Very good, Jen. Jen gets uh, credit so far for answering as many, uh, answering questions on chat. And so far all the answers have been correct. <laughs> so here's a question. Okay, I, I want you guys to participate in this one. The, the, habendum, the habendum clause is a part of, a deed of sale for real property, true or false? Don't read the rest, just read that part. Is it true or false? Well, some people might say true, but the reason I did this is because there's a mistake in that stem of the sentence. Because if it's gonna be a part of a deed, then it needs to be a space part, not the part which means something else. And you can read on your own when you get the, get the PowerPoint deck, what the Habendum Clause is, if you didn't know, it's basically the clause of most deeds that begin with to have and to hold, which in the old days actually meant two different things. To have is different from holding. Uh, how can you tell a theodolite apart from a total station? 
So by now you may have uh, figured out my scheme here. I'm trying to trick you because now it should be A-P-A-R-T, one word, not two different words, right? And how can you tell it beyond light apart from a total station? Why am I asking you these questions? Because they're gonna ask you questions relating to the English language, grammar, spelling, punctuation, and so forth. But they might also ask you some of the stuff I have in the response I put in here. So read it when you have a chance. Okay, who has this book? Raise your hand, Boundary, Brown's Boundary Control and Legal Principles, seventh edition. Any of you, the rest of you who are maybe asleep? Ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> well, here's the problem. I, I wrote the title incorrectly. Do you see that? The brown? Look what I have in red. The brown. Uh, yeah, you guys need to know the difference. Oh, thank you. Hey, don't pull books on me. <laughs> nice. Because I have, I don't know how many versions of this book and the other book, mm. but Sam, uh, Sean, I'm not criticizing you. Good for you. I'm glad you guys have these books because building a professional library before you become licensed or certified is a really important part of your career path. Now, there's no need to fear a lots, lots of things that I've asked you questions about because a lot of it is actually covered between the syllabus, so you can study, and the specific the uh, handbook which you can study. And remember, you can refer to the handbook. Of course, the more you have to refer to the handbook they give you, the more it's going to slow you down. But there's no need to completely fear because a lot of the equations that you may be hunting for, you go, I can't remember what it is. But what's the surface area of a sphere or the volume of a sphere will they in the in the handbook that they give you uh, who knows what utc is and compare that to gps time again i can't go through this in great detail you can look up this website <clears throat> but but gps time is different from utc which we often call greenwich mean time but that's considered outdated <clears throat> but GPS time does not have leap seconds, whereas UTC has leap seconds. So every now and then we will have a 61 second minute. And in the old days, when we had these clocks, pre-tuned radios I used to buy from Radio Shack when I did my uh, Polaris observations, you could actually stay up if you were a total geek. And I confess I never did this. So I'm not, I haven't reached the ultimate in geekdom, but people would stay up to listen to the 61st second in a minute, because now and then they would introduce a leap second. So I think right now, GPS time is about 20-ish seconds ahead of UTC. And if you go to this uh, leapsecond.com uh, URL, you can actually, uh, find out more about time. But time is a really important thing um, because this is how GNSS works, but the many other things are timed very carefully, although they don't need actual UTC to do it. Um, so you might wanna read up a little bit there. Uh, when it comes to measurements, the principal duty of a survey is to ensure that the precision is given precedence over accuracy. Is precision more important than accuracy? Thumbs up, thumbs down. I don't know if you can do that, you guys who don't have your cameras turned on. It's thumbs down. Accuracy is more important than precision because accuracy is how close your measurement is to the true value, whereas precision is how close measurements are to each other. But again, I have misspelled principle because I'm using the principle that's used in the title of the Brown's Boundary Control and legal principles book. And I wrote here, the principle means first in order. So the principal duty, meaning the first duty of a surveyor is to ensure that precision is given 
precedence over accuracy, wrong. So if this is true, false, you would answer wrong. Trent, did you say something? No, sir. Okay. You're good. Okay. Thought somebody spoke and I wasn't sure who. Almost done. So one of the things that people say, how do I, how do I learn all this grammar stuff? A lot of it ha can happen if you read, because it's really hard to go to college or take a junior college course, or even go back to high school if they have those courses for people who need to find jobs and they give you courses on grammar and this, that, and the other. You know, they're kind of boring. And so what I tell people is read books on topics that maybe are interesting to you. So I've just listed a few here. Measuring America is a, is a famous one. Uh, longitude, the search for longitude, how they figured out as, as navigators to figure out where they are longitude wise, which also were used by surveyors doing geodetic surveys. There's a new book coming out on latitude, which is a really interesting history about, about a whole bunch of things, but also how they measured an arc of the earth up in Lapland, And then another one down in Latin America, I wanna say Peru perhaps to figure out that the earth was an oblate spheroid, which means flattened at the poles as opposed to a prolate spheroid, which means flattened at the equator. The same woman, Dava Sobol, who wrote Longitude, also wrote an interesting book called Galileo's Daughter, which is really written as if it's by her daughter, but it's actually about Galileo, and he was a pretty amazing guy. Uh, you know, everybody gives Leonardo da Vinci a lot of credit for being this amazing guy, but I think Galileo was too. I put in Surrounded by Idiots because it's actually available as an audio book as well. And one of the problems with, with uh, speaking is that surveyors often have trouble testifying in court, speaking at a planning and zoning meeting or to a city council, speaking at a professional meeting, and one of the things I find that, that is very common, and I'm not saying this is true for any of you, but you, this may happen and you almost need to have somebody listen to you, is you often either get too technical or not technical at all, or you don't know how to explain a really technical concept in simpler terms. And so surrounded by idiots tells you how to separate the world into four different kinds of people and you just kind of factor your, your speech based on who you're dealing with. But here's a couple of other books, Mapping in America, Surveying in America. And then I said, I've read a bunch of these books on Everest, but there's books on how these uh, mountains, these, these are the tallest mountains on these continents. So Everest in Asia, obviously, Denali in North America, Aconcagua in South America, Everest in Europe, Kilimanjaro in Africa, Vincent Massif you can probably guess is Antarctica and Jaya Peak is actually in Australasia, Oceania, which is uh, New Guinea. But reading about how they were discovered, how they were surveyed, I mean, the really interesting stories about how Everest was surveyed are good ways for you to learn language and pay attention to language and also how you construct a document, a paragraph and a sentence rather than reading dull reference books. So just a suggestion, I'm not saying this is a must, but having, uh, if you don't read a lot, uh, or if you only read stuff on the internet, which most of the time you're skipping over half the words because you're in a hurry, this means taking time. And again, this may not work for you to help you do well on the exam if you're doing it you know, next week or even next year, but some, it's a habit that you might want to start that I want to encourage you to think about. So some of the other day's topics that I was wanting to throw in that maybe we can cover in a future, uh, future session of some of these. And then I just wanted to mention, and uh, Trent has already posted them, so I'm just telling you that I have some stuff on our GeoLearn channel as well as GeoLearn.com. Obviously everything on the YouTube channel is, is free. Um, some of the videos included there, preview of Dick Elgin, uh, you heard him last week and Gary Kent a few weeks ago uh, on these topics and most of our other courses are previewed there as well. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> no, that was awesome. I love it. Um, yeah, we can look at uh, some of those other topics we didn't hit tonight for September as well. So 
we'll uh, we'll keep kind of playing with these open sessions. It's always going to be that first Monday of the month. So, yeah, I had to uh, kind of compress a lot of information into a very few slides. And one of the things I want to encourage the people who are here is number one, uh, you can write to me. Uh, I, I don't know if you'll share there my, my email address, so I'm going to put it in here. But but also uh, write to Trent and tell him, you know, you'd like to see this particular subject discussed, and we can try to do that. By the way, parenthetical note, I'm working with Dane Corville. You guys uh, have seen him a couple of times. He's got his little printed manual. And one of the things I'm going to start doing is working some of his example problems and then adding to it, creating my own problems of the same ilk uh, to be available on the GeoLearn website. And we'll put short version, versions of those uh, on the free YouTube channel as well. That's awesome. I love it. Did anybody? Yeah. Does anybody have specific questions for Dr. Piva? It's kind of a quiet session by nobody really chiming in, but go for it, Quinn. Hello. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to take uh, a lot of anybody's time. Um, um, wow, overwhelming is an understatement for me. <laughs> um, I, my my goal is to be a professional land surveyor in the state of Tennessee. Um, I'm 26 years old. And that is what my what my end goal to be after the army. Now, um, I have very brief survey experience in the military world, but listening to 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 him explain all these different things, it's really overwhelming for me because I am in a college. Um, I'm in college for geography, and with it with a minor in GIS, and I I'm I'm fearful that I'm missing pretty much all of this in-depth technical math and, 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 and problem solving. And it's really, um, I, I really, I, I'm a sophomore in college and I guess my, this, this might be um, good for maybe a sidebar conversation, um, but I'm just, I just don't know how I'm going to be successful in, in with, with my end goal and get my, you know, my land, my licensure at, after a while. Um, uh I, I, I am on a path, but I don't know if I am on the right path yeah. to success. Good point. Well, Quinton, I, I for one, would be more than happy to talk to you. Uh, send me an email or send me a text and we can figure out a time that makes sense. I suspect Trent and all the other old timers would be willing to do the same. Uh, there's a lot that needs to be found out about what the requirements in your state are if you're planning on settling in Tennessee, because sometimes the requirements vary from state to state. Right. Um, I've, so I've already identified how I'm going to do it. And in Tennessee, all you, you have to have a, for my category, you have to have a degree related to surveying. So science, engineering, mathematics, um, and 24 extra hours of surveying specific things and my my education in the in the army has actually given me 12 or more hours of survey specific things now they didn't teach me a whole lot now i mean i i hate to say that but you know the army pretty much it didn't teach me a lot of the things that you're talking about the really in-depth yep. knowledge type of stuff um so well, yeah take what, take, what you, take what you started speaking put it into a well-formatted written email and send it to a bunch of us because we'll have more questions before we can start, start answering and maybe presenting some solutions that you might be able to get for achieving your objectives. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that sounds great. Um, how would I find everybody's emails and whatnot? I mean, I know you posted yours, but you, say, you said include more than yourself. Yeah, Quentin, I'll put a I'll put a whole email together and like just kind of do an introduction stuff with just like you know the five or six of us that can definitely kind of get you started on your path. So, um, and then I'll also do a follow up email from tonight's session, which will have a lot of the information discussed tonight and some of the book topic and stuff. So I'll do two separate ones. I'll kind of put one an introduction email together, and then we'll you'll see a follow up one that'll be called uh, what, Week Forty One. So, yep, great, awesome. Thank you so much. You got it. No worries. You're in the right, you're started out in the right path. That's for sure. <laughs> Good for you. That's awesome. Good stuff. Anybody else want to chime in or talk? 
we're all quiet, Dr. Paiva. <laughs> well, I hope I didn't overwhelm you. I mean, I get criticized sometimes for being the PhD and really no, no, all no. that means is it's fine. I'm over, overwhelmed deeper. because I have not studied this, this, this material. Yeah, well, I, I was speaking to everybody here. Oh, so sorry. People, even professional surveyors don't ask me why are uh, afraid to ask me questions because they think I'll laugh at them. And on the other, what I like to do is help people. You know, I like to help people to be successful. So feel That's free cool. to contact me. Uh, I'm busy with work right now, um, but I'm, uh, I'll eventually get to you. And if I don't reply after a week or so, Keep pestering me, and you'll eventually hear from me by phone, by Zoom, or by email. That's awesome. I appreciate it, Dr. Pilot, and uh, we'll do it again next week. Again, uh, apologies on the technical glitches, and hopefully we'll get it fixed for whenever. It's all good. Doing that. That's fine. We made it work. It's all that matters. Awesome, guys. Take Have care. a good night. Bye bye. Bye bye, guys. <laughs>